Such eternal, blissful, all-knowing forms of the Lord are usually not understood by even the best Vedic scholars, but they are always manifest to pure, unalloyed devotees. It is also stated in the Brahma Samhita, Ramadi Murtishu Kala Niyamena Tishtam Nan Avataram Akkarat Bhavantara Kintu Krishna Swayam Sambhavam Parama Purusam Yat Govindam Adipurusham Tamaham Gajami I worship the Supreme Personality of God at Govinda Krishna, who is always situated in various incarnations such as Rama, Nishringa, and many other sub-incarnations as well, but who is the original personality of God as known as Krishna, and who incarnates personally also. In the Vedas, also it is said that the Lord, although one without a second, manifests himself in innumerable forms. He is like the Vaidurya stone, which changes color, yet still remains one. All those multi-forms are understood by the pure analog devotees, but not by a simple study of the Vedas. Vedeshu Dorlabam Adorlabam Atma Bhaktal. Devotees like Arjuna are constant companions of the Lord, and whenever the Lord incarnates, the associate devotees also incarnate in order to serve the Lord in different capacities. Arjuna is one of these devotees. And in this verse, it is understood that some millions of years ago, when Lord Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita to the sun god Vivashvan, Arjuna, in a different capacity, was also present. But the difference between the Lord and Arjuna is that the Lord remembered the incident, whereas Arjuna could not remember. That is the difference between the part and parcel living entity and the Supreme Lord. Although Arjuna is addressed herein as the mighty hero who could subdue the enemies, he is unable to recall what had happened in his various past births. Therefore, a living entity, however great he may be in the material estimation, can never equal the Supreme Lord. Anyone who is a constant companion of the Lord is certainly a liberated person, but he cannot be equal to the Lord. The Lord is described in the Brahma Samhita as infallible, achuta, which means that he never forgets him himself, even though he is in material contact. Therefore, the Lord and the living entity can never be equal in all respects, even if the living entity is as liberated as Arjuna. Although Arjuna is a devotee of the Lord, he sometimes forgets the nature of the Lord, but by the divine grace, a devotee can at once understand the infallible condition of the Lord, whereas a non-devotee or a demon cannot understand this transcendental nature. Consequently, these descriptions in the Gita cannot be understood by demonic brains. Krishna remembered acts which were performed by him millions of years before, but Arjuna could not, despite the fact that both Krishna and Arjuna are eternal in nature. We may also note herein that a living entity forgets everything due to his change of body, but the Lord remembers because he does not change his Satchit Ananda body. He is a Dvaita, which means there is no distinction between his body and himself. Everything in relation to him is spirit, whereas the conditioned soul is different from his material body. And because the Lord's body and self are identical, his position is always different from that of the ordinary living entity, even when he descends to the material platform. The demons cannot adjust themselves to this transcendental nature of the Lord, which the Lord himself explains in the Bhagavad Gita. <coughs> so this is a very important verse. <coughs> of course, all the verses in Bhagavad Gita have got tremendous significance. Why is that? Because they're spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself. So everything to do with Krishna is eternal and absolute, and is also meant to help all the fallen conditioned souls, all the souls, all the living entities who reside not just on this planet, but in every single planet, and not just in this particular universe, but within all the billions and trillions of universes that exist. There is reference to the Lord that he incarnates and some in 
incarnations are mentioned, such as Lord Ramachandra and Lord Nishringadev. So Lord Ramachandra, he also performed amazing feats. Of course, if you want to study uh, the actual reason why Lord Ramachandra appeared, then we recommend that you read Valmiki's uh, translation of the Ramayana. The Valmiki Ramayana is the bona fide Ramayana. There are many different types of Ramayana, including the Ramcharit Manas. But Ramcharit Manas, uh, w which is written by Tulsidas, and in fact is probably one of the most popular of all translations, especially into Hindi, of the Ramayana, is not considered uh, to be on the same level as Valmiki Ramayana. Valmiki was a self-realized soul. Actually, the way that he ended up worshipping Lord Ram is that uh, at a young age, uh, he killed a person. Uh, and he felt very bad after doing that. And Narad Muni came to him and tried to alleviate his heavy burden of guilt that I have been the, uh, the person who's reduced another person's life untimely. I'm so fallen. I'm so contaminated. And so Lord Ramat, uh, Narad Muni, he said, well, you should uh, call in the names of the Supreme Lord. Uh, and Valmiki said, no, I can't, because constantly, I've tried to do that, but I can't do it. I'm constantly remembering uh, that sinful act that I performed. And so the word death uh, is always um, in my mind. I can't, I can't get the word death. And then the Sanskrit word for death is Mara. Mara means death. Just like murder means someone who's killed something, who's uh, destroyed somebody's life. So Mara also means the same thing. So then Martin Arad, when he said, all right, so you should constantly repeat the word Mara out loud. And Valmiki said, you're sure this is what I should be doing? And Narad Muni said, yes, this is, this is the proper thing that you should be meditating on now. So then he started to chant out loud, Mara, 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 Mara. And all of a sudden, Mara became Ram. You can try it yourself. Mara, 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 Mara. The Ram word is there. And so from Mara be becomes Ram. And he chanted like this for many thousands of years because he was born in a different age. He wasn't born in the age that we are born into this Kali Yuga. He was born uh, in the age of Treta Yuga, where the duration of life was 10,000 years. So he could spend a, a, a couple of thousand years just chanting this. And, and by doing so, uh, because the Lord and his name are non different, just like, of course, we chant regularly. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And by the mercy of the holy names, we can actually uh, understand uh, after some time, after we are able to transcend namabhas. That means when we're not offenselessly chanting, but there's, there's some uh, distraction as we're chanting. But the idea is that we become less and less distracted. The more that we chant, the more serious we become, and the more desirous we actually want to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. I have, you can say, personal experience. I was introduced to this Maha Mantra, uh, by Prabhupada's disciples in London in 1969. So how many years ago is that? 42. 42 years ago. And, of course, 
to join the temple, to live in the ashram with the devotees, to have that fortunate association, then one of the things that I had to promise to do was to chant minimum 16 rounds a day on my beats. And so I was given a set of beads in a bead bag and uh, told what the Maha Mantra was. And of course, in the beginning, just like everybody who has started chanting, you make mistakes. You can't remember exactly the words and the, the way that they're um, formed. Uh, but then after a while, of course, the more you chant, the more you remember. And the more you remember Krishna and Krishna's lotus feet. Because that transcendental sound vibration is as good as uh, having Krishna standing before you. So the more pure, you know, the, the, the when the understanding comes, the, we have to, to chant purely and with an undisturbed mind. Then Krishna will appear before us. He's already appearing before us in his sound vibration, and that transcendental sound is not different from himself. And not just himself, but all his associates, all his devotees. Uh, because he's a uh, supreme spirit, is uh, the absolute truth. Because he's 100% pure, then by constantly washing our brains, by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we end up become, becoming cleansed from all the dirty things. And when we're actually able to free ourselves from all dirty things, contaminated things, then we can understand truly that I'm not this body, that I'm Aham Brahmasmi, an eternal, pure spirit soul. Uh, this is what is giving consciousness to this lump of matter. Because actually the body is simply a combination of different material elements. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. These are the five gross elements. And then there's the three subtle coverings, mind, intelligence, and the false ego. So when we can actually break through and free ourselves from a hunkar, this false ego, uh, and we're able to really uh, give 100% our energy, our time, our uh, desire to see, the, see Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God, face to face, then he actually rises within our hearts, just like the morning sun. The morning sun rises, and as soon as the sun rises to a particular height in the sky, then all darkness is dispelled. There's no room for darkness. And as long as we can keep uh, the holy name fixed in our minds, fixed in our hearts, then Krishna Seeing that our hearts are becoming more and more cleansed, then he will agree to step into our hearts. But that place has to be perfectly clean uh, and in order also, very, uh, very much um, cleansed of all the nasty things that we've been associating with for so many millions and millions of births. And because the fact that we have a soul within our body, we feel light, not just in the, in the form of uh, the lack of darkness, but also our body feels light. Because actually, our real identity is that we're one ten thousandth part the tip of a hair in size. That is the Vedic uh, calculation as to the actual amount of space that we as jivatmas or uh, spirit souls, conditioned spirit souls, that's how much space that we occupy. Not very much space. And you can imagine also that the weight of the soul is subatomic. You can't put it on a, a measuring scale. Just like all of us 
uh, especially those of us who've lived in the Western atmosphere, are very conscious of our weight, isn't it? There's a huge industry out there that's convincing us that we should be of a certain bodily type, that we should not weigh over a certain amount according to our height, isn't it? There's all of these different calculations and, and so many different ways that we can attain that weight to height ratio uh, by diet, and by physical exercise, and so on, by swimming. Now, swimming is an interesting thing because um, a living body is able to float on the water, isn't it? But when the soul leaves the body, some or other there's more weight and the body sinks in the water. That's a fact. That a living body, that means a body possessing a soul, can float on the top of the water. But as soon as the soul leaves the body, the body sinks. So that means there's actually more weight. And Prabhupada was speaking about that just a few days ago in uh, Shuma Bhagavatam class in Los Angeles. This is in 1973. Just like Prabhupada also gives the example of the Earth. This Earth planet has got so much weight in the form of vast oceans oceans of water, and water is also very heavy. One liter of water is at least one kilo in weight, isn't it? That's about the ratio. One liter equals one kilo. So how many trillions of liters of water are to be found within the Pacific Ocean? Just the Pacific Ocean, which is the biggest of all the oceans. Then you also have to include the <laughs> Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Arctic Ocean, the Antarctic Ocean. How many trillions and trillions of liters of water are to be found within the total expanse of all the oceans? So that also equates to trillions and trillions of kilos. And that's not including the land. So we have vast areas of land, huge continents. Russia with 11 time zones, with so many mountain ranges, uh, with the Urals and so many other mountain ranges are there. Uh, what to speak of the Himalayas? The Himalayan range is 1,500 kilometers in length. And so all these mountains that we see, or we hear about, and of course, if you get the opportunity, and you happen to be in India, and you're flying in the northern part of India, <coughs> just like also many people who go to Nepal, they, they charter small planes, and they fly up just to see all the Himalayan mountain peaks. And of course, including Mount Everest, which is the tallest. How many trillions of cubic meters of stone or rock. Can you, can you estimate no, the no. weight? Can anyone here estimate the weight of all the Himalayan mountains? I don't think so. But it must be also incredibly heavy. <laughs> when I was living in India, uh, Sometimes I got the opportunity to fly to a place called Manipur. This is a, a northeastern state of India. It's the most eastern part of India. In fact, it's the other side of Bangladesh, and it's a border with Myanmar, which used to be called Burma. And there the sun rises at least half an hour to one hour, according to the time of the year, before it rises in Delhi, what to speak of rising in Dwarka. So there, the sun rises at 3 o'clock in the morning in the summer, and in Dwarka, the sun rises about 4 o'clock in Dwarka. But it's all one time zone, otherwise it can become very confusing. So already India is quite a confusing place, but you don't want to make it more confusing by adding different time zones. So they just stick to one time zone. Although, in fact, 
they are further east than Bangladesh, and Bangladesh is 15 minutes ahead of time of India. <laughs> or half an hour, I think it's half an hour, is that right? Is that half, an half an hour. Pakistan is half an hour behind, and Bangladesh is half an hour ahead. So then you consider the Rocky Mountains. It's another very long range of mountains uh, that rise in Alaska. And that spine, you can call it a spine, goes all the way down to Patagonia in South America. That's a distance of about 5,000 miles, about 7,500, 8,000 kilometers of just mountains, mountain peaks, mountain ranges. And Prabhupada made an interesting comment. He was flying from North America to Venezuela, to South America, to, to visit the Caracas Temple. I think, have you been to the Caracas Temple? Yes. And he noticed that there also, in that area, there's many, many mountain peaks. And he was thinking that how they've calculated the height of these mountains is not so accurate. Uh, and also, he flew over the uh, Swiss Alps. Of course, the Swiss, French, Italian, Austrian, there's so many Alps are there. It's the same. They're, they're actually, Prophet said that the, those Alps, those mountains, are related to the Himalayan mountain range. How they were related, I don't know, but he did say that. So if, if you just, you know, just consider all the different mountains, of course, here in this country, there's a, there's a complete paucity, there's a complete lack of mountains. One of the few countries in the world where there's absolutely, practically zero mountains, except in the south. Limburg, what's, what's the tallest? place in Limburg, or oh, Tilburg. Oh, how, how high is that? 300 meters. 300 meters. 300 meters. <laughs> Not so tall. Because in the Himalayas, there's mountain peaks that are over 8,000 meters. And there's many above 8,000 meters. So if you put all the mountains and all the Quarries, for instance, is in so many in so many countries, like in Italy, where you have the Apennines, there's also marble quarries, and they are excavating so much marble, uh, and and so they're they're also moving millions of cubic meters of marble for all different kinds of purposes, especially for making. Uh, um, floor coverings, marble floors, marble flooring. What to speak of in, in India, in Rajasthan, is a place called Makrana. Anybody know about Makrana? It's known for marbles. It's also known for marble, yes. Uh, for the best quality white marble. In fact, most of our Iskran deities around the world, they came from Makrana. The, the marble was cut in the quarry in Makrana in Rajasthan and then brought to Jaipur and made into beautiful deities of Gornitai, Radha Krishna, Sita Ram, Lakshman, Hanuman, and so on and so forth. So we're not even talking about the rivers and the lakes that also possess so much water, volumes of water, uh, like the Caspian Sea the Mediterranean Sea, the Bosporus, and so many lakes. There's the Great Lakes that uh, lie on the border between America and Canada. Uh, Lake Erie, Lake Michigan, the St. Lawrence River Seaway, the Huron, and so on. I can't remember all of the names. But they're also huge bodies of water, and they're not even considered oceans. They're just seas, or lake, they're not even seas, they're lakes, because of course here we have the North Sea, and the North Sea is what divides Britain from 
the rest of Europe, uh, along with the Channel. Then what to speak about the ice, like in Greenland. How many cubic meters of ice cover Greenland? And the Arctic and the Antarctic. Of course, they're saying because of all the pollution and the ozone and so forth that this ice mass is melting. But then again, it starts to freeze. It's not 100% sure. And of course, the scientists say, well, thousands of years ago, there was ice ages, and there was, then the ice receded, and it started to grow back again, and there was a mini ice age, and so on and so forth. But this is also weight. Then you think about the forests, like the Amazon forest. How many trees are growing there? What is the weight of each tree? But yet, and of course, what to speak of all the living entities residing on this planet, all the species of life, the human species, the elephant species, the rhinoceros, the giraffes, uh, the whales in the oceans, the sharks, like a whale can weigh up to 50 tons, 100 tons. It can be huge. But even according to the Vedic understanding, there's one fish that none of the uh, paleontologists ever talk about. Uh, called the Timingila fish. The Timingila, have you heard of such a fish? Yes. Timingila? Yes. Who says yes? Well, what is the Timingila fish? I don't know in English, but I, I heard about it in, uh, when you read in Ramayana, you will see when Hanuman crosses the uh, ocean, he comes across this. This Timingila yeah. fish. And this fish is so huge, it can swallow whales whole in one bite. It can swallow a whale. So you can imagine the size of the Tinangila fish that's residing in the oceans. And yet, with all this weight of all these different species of life and mountains and oceans and seas and rivers and trees and quarries, this planet is floating in space. It's floating in space. Why is it floating? Because you can imagine, if there's all this weight, why shouldn't it fall down? Why is it support? What is the support of time? Anybody know the answer? It's gravity. <laughs> that's that's what Sir Isaac Newton would like you to believe. It is supported by. But is it is it like a magnetic pull? Is there like a big magnet hanging above the Earth? And because of all the iron ore, some or another, is the magnet above, is, is holding it up. Just like you can take, you know, a nail, and you a strong magnet, and you can pick it up. Yes? The, the whole uh, universe, all universe, supported by Sheshnar. Shesh yes, but we're not talking about the universe, we're talking about this planet. Now you're jumping the gun a little bit. I was going to get to that, but... but just let's focus on just this one planet, and there's, and there's many, many planets, and so many stars, and all these planets are floating in, in, this, in, the, in the sky, isn't it? This planet is supported by Shesh. This planet is supported by, actually, Sheshanaga, who is an expansion of Balaram. Balaram means one who's got all strength, not just physical strength. Of course, you imagine the strength that this Sheshnag that Shanti is talking about, how much strength does he possess that he's supporting all of the universes? And I mentioned that there's billions and trillions of universes, and they're, they're balancing on the hoods of this snake. But he doesn't even feel any disturbance. Practically, he doesn't feel that they're there. And this is a tiny universe, talking about giving some comparison to other universes. This universe is small compared to other universes that are existing simultaneously outside this universe. But we can't really understand fully what is going on in these universes. Of course we can. We get the idea from studying uh, Srimad Bhagavatam especially. 
In fact, that's what we're studying at the moment in the third canto. Uh, in the morning, we have the Srimad Bhagavatam class where we uh, read and uh, read Srila Prabhupada's purports about the nature of this universe, this cosmology. For the reason that this planet is suspended in the sky, is floating in the sky, is because of spirit soul, because of the existence of the soul. The super soul, the supreme soul, the supreme personality of soulhood, Krishna. Just like I mentioned that when you're swimming in the, in the water, you feel buoyant, you feel light. Uh, actually, you're, you're feeling light because actually you have a, you're, you're alive. But if you, like as, as, like as I mentioned, when a dead body is found, it usually sinks <coughs> in the water, eventually, because it becomes heavier. But what makes everything light uh, is the fact that it's a touch of the soul. And in this universe, there is a personality called Garbo Dakshay Vishnu. And Garbo Dakshay Vishnu, he's also floating on water. He's floating on what's known as a Garbo Dak ocean. And every universe is half filled with this ocean. And he's lying on Sheshana. That's his, that's his couch or his bed. And at his feet there's Lakshmi. And Lakshmi is massaging the feet of her husband. Garbhadakshai Vishnu. And from Garbhadakshai Vishnu's navel, there is a lotus stem growing. And at the top of the lotus stem, there is a lotus flower. And within that lotus flower, you'll find Lord Brahma. So just like for us to be born, all of us, all the human beings present today, we required a mother and a father. Now, we weren't born on the lotus floor. We were born out of our mother's vagina. Right? From the womb. Because the baby <coughs> is conceived within the womb. So we all came down the birthing canal and left via the vagina of our mother. That's how we took, took birth. And we had an umbilical cord connecting us to the mother, which of course is cut at the time of birth. But Lord Brahma, he's known as Atma Bhu, or Svayam Bhu. He doesn't require a mother and a father for his birth. He's quite a unique personality. He's born out of the navel of Lord Vishnu. Just like we have navels, we sometimes play with them as children, and sometimes little dust collects there and fluff, <laughs> navel fluff, and we pick it out. <laughs> but that was, you know, we all, we all have that. This is evidence that we were connected with our mother. This is the little, you know, evidence that we all carry within our bodies. It's navel, nabha, nabha is called in Sanskrit, nabha, <coughs> nabha, nor nabhi. And, uh, but just see the amazing possibility of, not just possibility, but the fact that Garbhadakshaya Vishnu does not require uh, any external help to produce a child. Because Brahma is a child of uh, Garbhadakshaya Vishnu. But for us, because we are in material bodies, and uh, we're all subject to birth. Our birth is, can only happen when there's a mother and a father. So the father gives the seat to the mother, and the mother carefully protects that seat within her womb, and it fructifies and grows into a child. Uh, but Krishna and all his expansions, all his multi-expansions, uh, like Garbhadakshaya Vishnu, Karanadakshaya Vishnu, Kiradakshaya Vishnu, he can perform any act with any part of his body. Just like the simple thing of we're, we're making an offering 
on the altar. So someone who's not familiar with this type of activity will say, well, what's the point of putting a plate of food on the altar? Because nobody eats it. It comes out again, and it's all there. Nothing's been taken. There's, there's, there's no evidence that someone's eaten anything. <laughs> but the Lord can eat with his ears, and he can also eat with his eyes. We can't do that. We have to eat with our mouths, because we're limited. Uh, our senses are limited. And the function of the senses, and the function of our body is, is limited. But, but Krishna and his multi-expansions, they're not limited. They're unlimited. And because Lord Brahma, uh, he has the great fortune to actually go back home, back to Godhead, uh, within his life. Of course, his life is also on a completely different time scale to life on earth. Uh, his 100 years, that's how long he lives for, is 100 Brahma years. And if you want to know the number of years that equates in earth years, then I suggest you get a copy of Bhagavad Gita, because you'll get the information there. But it's a long, long time. Longer than the, what the scientists believe in when this universe came into being. They, they calculate it to be something like 13 billion years ago. But that's a tiny, insignificant amount of time compared to the duration of life of Lord Brahma. And if you really want to understand where this cosmos comes from, then you have to become involved in practicing Bhakti Yoga. Because that's the only way you'll be able to actually understand fully how life began. Don't be fooled by the present day modern scientists propaganda. It's all false propaganda. Because they do not verify their findings according to Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. It's all mental speculation and mental concoction. And we're not interested in <coughs> mental concoction because just like when there's a big rubbish heap so many crows will fly to that place, especially if you ever get the opportunity to visit. There's a very uh, big city in India called Calcutta, but they call it Kolkata now, Kolkata. It's the same, same city. Nothing's changed because of substituted C's for K's. Now instead of C-U-L-C-A, it's K-O-L-K-A-T-A, but it's the same city with the same rubbish problems. <laughs> and they have what's known as kak, crows, many crows. And the crows love to dive into the rubbish and find out the, most, the nastiest of horrible things. Uh, I've seen myself, like in the winter time, Kolkata can also get cold. They can get down to 14, 12 Celsius, sometimes lower, 8, 8 Celsius. And a lot of the residents of Kolkata, because they don't have proper um, clothing sometimes, they're, they're not so used to wearing so much clothing because, generally speaking, it's much warmer than it is colder. There's a very short cold season and a very long warm season. So because they don't dress properly and they're not eating properly, then they develop mucus within their throats. So in the morning, especially about 6 o'clock when people are getting up and they're doing all their ablutions and call of nature and so on and so forth. They have these things called tongue scrapers. You know about that? Tongue scrapers? Where they're... <laughs> they're doing this. <laughs> and there's millions of them that are doing this. <laughs> they're trying to bring up all the mucus, <laughs> which is in their throats and in their lungs. Because a lot of them smoke and, you know, like I said, they're not leading very healthy lives. 
And because of that, there's generally speaking uh, too much mucus uh, created within the body. And then when they get this mucus moving, then they spit it out. And the first thing that happens is a big black crow cr flies down and eats it up. And thinks, oh, what a treat. Oh, this is delicious. <laughs> they like to feed on mucus. Isn't that disgusting? <laughs> so because we're old crows, because we've lived in the West and we've chewed the chewed so many times and so many lives, so many lives have been spent uselessly chasing after mucus. We're old crows. And now we want to give up those horrible things and now we want to actually uh, appreciate real, the, the genuine things. Uh, and the genuine thing in, in our human form of life, if we really are seriously interested and we're not becoming deviated by this thing or that thing, or that's the thing because you know, we're being bombarded constantly by the media, by the television, by advertising, by the cinema, by the newspapers and magazines and radio and so many other types of technology that is, you know, surrounding us. Uh, and all these <coughs> companies that make all these different types of technologies are, again, using their propaganda that if you really want to be happy, you need a full HD flat screen TV. You need an electric car. You need this thing. You need this clothing. You need to wear, what do they call it? These special footwears that people wear here? Made in Australia? Oops. 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 You call them oops? Yeah. Clogs. No, 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 that's clunkies. That's not there. I don't mind clunkies, no. In, in English we say ugs. Ugs, yeah. Ugs. That's supposed to be a word that the Stone Age men would speak in. Oh, <laughs> you know that? You understand why they use that? Because it looks kind of primitive. You know. So people are, 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 are crazy for certain Uggs or certain types of jewelry or certain types of, uh, you know, mascara or lipstick or, you know, I mean, you know, the world is full of all these advertising plans for you to spend your money on things that you really don't need. But what we do really need is to get out of this place and never come back again. Go back home, back to Godhead. In this life, finish up our business. Not loiter. Life after life after life after life. That's the message of the Vedas. That's the message that Krishna is giving. And, he's, and actually, he's speaking to Arjuna and telling, I've been around for so long, and because my body is such it and under, it's eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss, I never forget anything. But because you're not God, you forget. That's the difference between God and ourselves. Krishna never forgets. We always forget. We always forget. It's so easy to forget because of all the different distractions. But now we have to become focused. This is the time where we have to actually Try to become focused in <coughs> developing our Krishna consciousness. That's the message of Bhagavad Gita. And we have to finish that. Oh, 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 oh. Bhagavad Gita Gita Sita, Jiva Prabhupada Gita, Jiva Prabhupada Gita.